Once again, Bill, I want to thank you for the work that you did on the lecture. And uh, I think that uh, this lesson gets into some pretty deep water. It does. Uh, <laughs> this is, I mean, all of the things that we've said have had things to talk about, but this is a theologically deep, uh, and there are many things. I don't think we're going to be able to get into everything and to all the different implications of, of what's in here. Uh, but uh, there are a few that I wanted to make sure that we brought up. Uh, but again, I want to thank you for the work that you did uh, and for directing us to the two books. Actually, N.T. Wright was your idea, and Jim, the other one was your idea, wasn't it? I, I came across Lennox. Yeah. Right? yeah. And then I knew Brueggemann already, yeah. Yeah. so it kind of fit to, they fit together for us very well. So uh, this has really been a group effort. But yes, it has. you have been the captain of the ship and the guiding force, and I appreciate all well, the Well, the last session, did. I even had my I know. shirt on. I saw that. Didn't we're, wear that we're, we're just the crew. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we're just the crew manning the oars. So, anyway, to get to the lesson. Uh, in the lecture, in the first part of the lecture, uh, the reason or the uh, purpose for this chapter was stated as trying to find out what does the rest of the New Testament, and in particular the rule of the Holy Spirit, have to teach us about our response to the pandemic. Uh, but immediately in the lecture after saying that, uh, you went into uh, the Passover. To the Gospels. Pa no, actually. The Passover. You, you okay. went to the Passover. Uh, Passover's Old Testament. That's mm -hmm. not n New Testament. Uh, how do we reconcile you going into the Passover, Bill? Well, well again, Scripture is Scripture, <laughs> I understand. Yeah. But there is a difference in looking at when do people live and in which era do they live mm -hmm. and what's going on in their lives. Um, uh, one of the reasons of doing that is to show here we have a context, and the context is not just in, in when Jesus is there. But the context even is before him, because people come with already an experience, and Jesus also follows that. That's part of his his uh, experience and part of his life. And so, being a part of the Passover is something he's done since childhood. Uh, and and so we see the connections of how God continues to work through time. And I heard somebody say one time that the Passover is at least one of, if not the most significant Old Testament event. Uh, because of the uh, the uh, sacrificial system that was put in place. Yeah, I think that if you go through the New Testament, you keep finding Passover uh, as much as you as you keep finding the wilderness mm. uh, and uh, the, the, the ten, when the Ten Commandments are given and so forth, and and that uh, say, uh, when God has to save the people again, that redemption period. Those two areas keep coming up because they are metaphors for so much of what's going on. Uh, and I think, it, uh, I, I agree with you, uh, Jesus was Jewish yes. uh, and kept the law. Uh, he didn't, as he said, he didn't come to destroy the law, he came to fulfill it. Uh, and <clears throat> the, at the Last Supper, uh, which most people believe was a Passover supper, uh, Jesus said that he had desired to have this meal at this time with these people. Uh, so if, in fact, it was the Passover meal, uh, it is important uh, for us to understand why Jesus thought having this supper with his disciples. Uh, what do you think, Jim? Well, the, the, the Old Testament, we read about that Passover. And, of course, that Passover was observed all the way up, like you said, uh, with, with Jesus because he and his disciples were, were uh, observing that Passover that was started in Egypt. Mm. But then Jesus gave his disciples, he's given us a new Passover. Mm. The, the old Passover was was the, the Israelites were to sacrifice the lamb, uh, take the blood, p 
put it outside over the door mm -hmm. and the angel would pass over the Israelites. He would, the, they would be saved because of that blood. And today, with the Passover that we have, that Jesus gave us, he was the lamb, yeah. the sacrificial lamb. And it's through his blood that we are saved. Uh, I, I, I like what, what Bill wrote, that he was quoting Brueggemann, yes. uh, saying that the, um, Brueggemann says that the, that the news is that we are profoundly cared for in a world under threat. So I think that has a connection today with the virus yeah. because we know that we're cared for because of Jesus mm. and his sacrifice. The, uh, not only were they saved, but they were also delivered at the Passover. Mm. Uh, and uh, a lot of, unfortunately for too many years, I, uh, thought I was saved but not delivered, yes. okay? Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, we Jesus had died for my sins from the point of my baptism backwards, but that it was my responsibility to take care of the sins that took place after that. But in fact, uh, Scripture teaches, I now know that Scripture teaches that uh, we have not only been saved, but we've also been delivered from the power of, of sin and of death. There's past sins, present sins, future sins. Yeah. The one thing I always appreciated about the Greek language was when I found that the perfect verb, which, which when it says uh, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin, that it was a perfect verb, which meant the blood of Jesus once cleanses us from sin, now cleanses us from sins, and okay. continues yes. cleanses us from sins. Now, does that mean that we can be profligates and do anything we want? Of course not. Uh, but at the same time, what it does say is I can have assurance yes. that uh, I can count on him as my redeemer yeah. and that I'll not only be saved now, but I look, I look with hope to a final yeah, to the future. Yeah. And that we can have uh, our faith in God's power to deliver us regardless yes. of what it is. Um, I think Paul answered the question pretty strongly uh, whether we can, once we have been saved by the grace of God, we can continue to live in sin. Yes. Uh, I think he pretty well said, <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> emphatically. Yes, emphatically, emphatically in, in his writing. Uh, uh, that, <laughs> that we have, been, we have been delivered, and so therefore we are expected to live as those who have been delivered. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, another quote from the lecture is, the Christian ethic in a time of plague considers our own life must always be regarded less important than that of our neighbor. Uh, so is that saying that we should not wear a mask and not get the get the shots uh is that saying that we should uh, uh throw off all i mean should we hide in our homes and not go out should um uh, well the context in which i said those words were said was was i was quoting again from as you said the gospels here with mm. uh Jesus is famous as famous words of do unto others as you would have them do unto you or greater love has no man than this and he laid down yeah. his life for his friends. Um, so if you're looking at, at the time in which we live, uh, whose life do you regard? If you love people, if you love others, then who's going to be important for you? Are you going to follow, again, this Jesus? Or are you going to follow your own whims of staying safe for yourself? Mm -hmm. Even if you could. It's not going to happen. So that was said kind of in that context. But I really do believe uh, that it calls for a time, and I'm, I'm pleased to say I've seen more evidence of that, where uh, people have cared more about uh, others than they have themselves in many, many cases. And uh, when you look at the caregivers that we've had, many of them have given their lives yeah. uh, to caring for others, knowing that they were really bringing it upon themselves if they continued that. Yeah, we would be in, in pretty bad shape if the doctors and nurses in the hospital had refused 
uh, to treat people uh, yes, until right. they themselves were totally protected. Exactly. Right. Uh, but is this saying, uh, does that justify us being clustered? Should we hide from the world? There may be occasions when you have to. Mm. Uh, what, what is the, the, the higher calling sometimes? Um, for instance, I have heart disease. I have a lung disease. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was told that it, with the COVID possibilities of getting COVID, uh, if I got it, I was not going to last very long. Mm. It just was not not give myself. Don't say, well, you've got a 60, you don't have any chances. Yeah, yeah. So the only way I could really control that was to cloister myself inside, making sure that I uh, was in contact with no one and, and took care of myself until I could get the, the medications that we were going to have viruses uh, to, to take care of the virus so I could feel safe again. So yeah, there are times when you have to withdraw, uh, probably important times, but there are times when you have to engage and become a part of things. And part of what I was trying to do as I was in, in cloister was figuring out how I can be engaged. Yes. And so I spent a lot of time, as you know, in, in writing and, and, and my, my work and uh, studies uh, to try to at least make up that time as best I could. And uh, you also have to weigh the uh, immediate versus the long term. True. Uh, you could have gone out, you could have said... Uh, that you were going to go ahead and and uh, go to church and and teach a Sunday school class because you I know you've done both of those, even preaching sometimes as well, uh, and and you could have said I'm going to go ahead and do that even though I know it's going to kill me. <laughs> yes. Uh, but you you wouldn't have been able to to do this. True. You wouldn't have been here. Uh, the chances we, are. Yeah, we would have been robbed of of your wisdom and your direction uh, for the future. I mean, all of us are going to die sometime, and we, there is no way that we can get a 100% chance of not dying no. uh, because we have a 100% di- chance of dying sometime. True, right. Uh, but this is not a verse that tells us to be uh, foolish. Right, exactly. Uh, and to take unnecessary risk. Uh, I believe uh, Paul actually talked about that too when he said he's in a straight between the two, whether it is better to stay here for your benefit or to go on and be with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he uh, weighed the two and made a decision. It's not an easy decision to make either. No, no. Uh, Jim, got anything on that? Well, you know, you mentioned about wearing masks and... It, uh, it's been proven that it, the mask protects us mm-hmm. and it protects other people. That's true. So they, I've heard people say, you know, you need to consider other people when you go to the store or yeah. when you go yeah. out yeah. That, that you don't want to harm anybody else. Um, that uh, this letter that, that uh, Martin Luther wrote that I thought was so interesting. It's, yeah. it's a lengthy letter yeah. that he wrote to a friend who lived, who, who lived in, in another city. Uh, and the purpose of the letter, this friend was wanting to know if he should leave the city. So Luther... Get, get away from the virus. Right, get yeah. away from the people. So Luther is, is talking to him and explaining the pros and cons about about leaving or staying. Mm-hmm. And this one portion of the letter yeah. that, that he wrote to this Dr. Hess, uh, Luther wrote, I shall ask God mercifully to protect us. Then I shall fumigate, help purify the air, administer medicine and take it. I shall avoid places and persons where my presence is not needed in order not to become contaminated and thus perchance inflict and pollute others and so cause their death as a result of my negligence. If God should wish to take me, he will surely find me, and I have done what he has expected of me, and so I am not responsible for either my own death or the death of others. If 
My neighbor needs me, however, I shall not avoid place or person, but will go freely as stated above. See, this is such a God-fearing faith because it is neither brash nor foolhardy and does not tempt God. So like you mentioned about foolishness, we need to be careful. It's, it's a fine line about, you know, uh, uh, what you said yeah. about these things. Sounds yeah. like an excellent uh, present letter. Does somebody get it written it almost? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yes, yeah. yeah. It's very good for today. And uh, it's difficult because there's not a one-size-fits-all answer. <clears throat> yes. Right. Uh, well, and uh, as Luther said there, he's still going to fumigate. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And medicine. And medicine. Medicine. Okay. Social distancing. What was available at that time. Yes. 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 Yeah. He was uh, going to take the best advice of medical, uh, but nonetheless, still, as, as you said in the lecture, uh, the priority is if my neighbor needs me, I will be there. Yes. Yeah. And to the extent that I can provide support for my neighbor, I will. Exactly. And if God chooses to take me, then then He will take me. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, not an easy, not an easy answer, and not an easy question to deal with. Uh, and uh, we don't we don't like hard questions. <laughs> okay. Another quote out of the lecture. The God who made the world, who became human in Jesus of Nazareth, is the God who comes and gets his hands dirty and gets his hands pierced in order to be where we are and... And to rescue. To and, rescue. Uh, sorry, I can't spell. And, so I was, and to rescue us from there. He has experienced it and he will continue to do so. That's an interesting quote. And uh, I'm reminded of the scripture that says uh, Jesus was tested in all points like as we are yet without sin. Uh, there, there are some people, uh, there are some beliefs uh, that on the cross Jesus physically experienced all of the, uh, all of the punishment for sin literally in every instance. Do you think Jesus came down with COVID? <laughs> was, uh, was, I, I think so many times in, in order to try to understand something more thoroughly, we confuse it. Mm. And so we miss the big picture. Mm. The scriptures are not trying to give us a detailed kind of thing of each thing that Jesus had. He didn't have leprosy. Yeah. But did he know how to deal with a leper? Yeah. Was, was he um, uh, amidst it and so forth? Was he as susceptible as any human being would be? Of course. Yes. And I think we miss the ma we don't want to miss the main ma message there, that that Jesus uh, was not sitting above saying, "Hey guys, I'll I'll sit here and let you get it worked out," but he had come and been a part of it, and that's what he's still saying is, "I'm I'm there with you." Whatever you're experiencing, I'm in your midst, and uh, I'm, I, his healing process is still is still there. So, it, it may not have been the COVID, may not have been leprosy, but Jesus was suffering pain, yeah. and I, I think yes. that's in general the pain that that he was suffering, physical and also mental anguish, mental anguish when he was there on the cross. Because yeah. some some people also have written about this. That at that point, at that point, because of the sin, yeah. that he was separated from the Father. What? The the one only time that he was ever totally separate from the Father. And that mental anguish, I believe, was even worse than physically what he was suffering there on the cross. And as a matter of fact, I mean, you've got scripture that backs you up on that one when, when Jesus from the cross said... My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Yeah, I, I'm, I was brought this up one time, and somebody said all he was doing was quoting from that passage in Psalms. Yeah, well, and and I said there was that passage, in, there is that passage in Psalms. That's true. But I think at that time he was actually feeling that separation. And uh, and it. it to use a quote doesn't mean it's not true. Yes. Well, yeah. 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 Or it's not applicable. Yeah. Right, yeah. 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 Uh, and the question is, uh, 
I didn't see any quotation marks around that, and he also didn't put any uh, uh, Psalms references in it as well. So I well, don't think he was doing it for the purpose of quoting Scripture. Some of those Psalms were prophecy yes. about what would take place sometime in the future. Mm -hmm. And it certainly does indicate that there was a uh, separation from the eternal. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, that... that Again, deep water here. Uh, I mean, what does that mean, and, and how does that work? I've got some volumes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, and again, uh, Bill, I think you quoted in the first, uh, maybe it was the second chapter, uh, about Jesus' agony in the garden. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, if... If the garden doesn't show that Jesus experienced the fear and dread, yeah. and actually, what is it that we have in the COVID virus? Actually, uh, it is terrible what it does to your lungs and what it does to your body, but the the fear that has gone out throughout the community. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a there's a hymn that I don't I've never seen it anywhere except Churches of Christ. It's a, it's a beautiful hymn called Night with Ebon Pinion. Mm. It's only sung the only person I know that that's, that's put it in an album uh, is Ray Walker, mm. and it's a beautiful beautiful hymn. And it's the Night with Ebon Pinion when Jesus uh, stood before it was before the veil and all around was silent except the night wind's wail. Mm. And he talks about uh, that whole thing of being in the garden. Mm -hmm. and it's a very moving uh, hymn, one of my favorite hymns of all time. And the reason for that is that it makes you realize uh, the seriousness mm -hmm. of being with, withdrawn from people, being alone, and being suffering. You're doing it by yourself. Yeah. And this has been the case of so much mm -hmm. of the COVID, is that people have suffered by themselves right. in the sense that they're isolated from family. They have no one there to hold their hand. Oh, yeah. yes. They have no one to give them comfort. Yes. And it is a night with ebon pinion, a dark yeah. night of the veil, yeah. when people experience that. Uh, so we have to have, if we do not have this uh, sense of Christ's presence, of God's presence, then it's even more agony yeah. that we're undergoing. Anything else you want to put, say about that? I was just going to add that, uh, you know, we've seen on the news what you said about this loneliness mm. and about being separated from the family that in, where, when they show some of these nursing homes yeah. where they finally allow the families to come in and, and hug, yeah. you know, yeah. just the very fact of, of hugging. There, there was the, the example of, of this uh, married couple the, that they haven't been able to touch each other yeah. for months. Yeah. And they finally brought the husband to the nursing home, and the wife was just, she could not wait to feel the embrace of her husband. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you said it, because one, one of the things is, is that uh, I've always been a, a touch of, I think I mentioned this once, that in my, in my family, everybody touched, and then mm -hmm. if you went to the bathroom, you hugged people before you went to the bathroom, and you came out, you hugged them again. <laughs> it was that kind of a touching we touched all the time. Yeah. This has been agony for me because I'm a hugger. I used to have in my, in my office, uh, my therapy office, I had a little, uh, somebody made me this beautiful heart, and it said, hugs are given here, <laughs> who was one of my the patients, one of my clients. And, uh, and, and I've had people come in, and you're very careful of touching people that yeah. you're not sure you should. Yeah. But I've had people come in who were, were really hurting, yeah. and they, they pointed they at point and said, is, is, is that true? <laughs> they were needing a hug so bad. Yeah. Oh, know. yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, our preacher, Jeff. Yes. Uh, He's a hugger. Yeah. <laughs> he he <laughs> said one of his biggest problems, uh, not only as a minister, but also a counselor, yes. and he does a lot of counseling, and he said one of his biggest points of exposure is in his counseling because people want to be touched. Yes. People want yes. to be hugged. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, mm -hmm. And he can't be standoffish uh, because of his very it's nature. A, it's a, um, having been there, it is a, um, it is a great burden. Mm. And it's, a, it's a, a difficulty we've created 
uh, and the, the Freud system created a lot of that. Yeah. You stayed separate, and he, you, you put him on a couch, and you stayed on a couch. Yeah. But part of it, uh, as we know from history, uh, Freud was not was not comfortable <laughs> with being close to people and touching people. Yeah, yeah. So he created that as nature, part of his, yes. he created that as part of his theory. Uh, but if you take an existentialist, an existentialist is saying, you know, where there is a relationship going on here. Sure. And can you think of a good relationship in which you didn't you never touched anybody? You know. Well, and as a matter of fact, we have scripture that kind of backs that up because Jesus brought the disciples with him to the, to the garden and he kept going back to them and saying, you need to be with me, okay? Yes. You need to be not asleep. You yes. need to be involved. I need your support. Yes. And they kept failing him and he kept being alone. I, I don't want to get too far afield with this, but it's always been a very important subject for me. Someone did a research years ago in Europe and they had people, how much people would touch within an hour talking to each other. Yeah. They, they, they touched each other somewhere like 120 times during an hour's period while they're talking. Mm. Americans, four times. Wow. <laughs> and the writer said, no wonder Americans are out of touch. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's very good. And uh, I, so it's, been, it's always been an important psychological value for me. And Jim, the, uh, the scene that I saw on TV that I will never be able to forget was... Um, something like what you were talking about in the nursing home, except this was in the hospital. And the husband and wife were both dying of COVID, mm. but they were in separate parts. Yes. And finally the doctor said, Put them together. they're they going to die together. anyway. They, and they so you had together. a picture of these two people in hospital beds reaching out and holding, holding hands, hands as holding they hands. died. It's yeah. 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 too yeah. moving to watch almost. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it yeah. certainly is. Uh, Jim, do you have your Bible on your phone? Uh, no, I don't. Uh-oh. I have a Bible right now. Oh, you have a Bible? Uh, look up Romans 8.26, because I think it's important that we read this before we discuss this part of this. Yes. Uh, actually, I wrote it out because I, I knew you were going to ask that. Oh, good. <laughs> and, good. And it's a small print, so I've, got, I've actually got three different uh, translations, simply because I think it's one of those that it helps you. In, in order to understand this language because it's sometimes more difficult. The one I prefer, and that's this Bible here, is the New Jerusalem Bible, which is a great study Bible. People haven't used it. Uh, and it says, it quotes uh, 26 and 27. Mm -hmm. The Spirit comes to help us in our weakness. For what we do not know, for when we do not know how to pray properly, then the Spirit personally makes uh, our petitions for us and groans that cannot be put into words. And he who can see all hearts knows what the Spirit means because the prayers that the Spirit makes for God's holy people are always in accordance with the mind of God. Yeah. Uh, I think it, I, I thought it was important that we read yes. that verse yes. uh, because the... Uh, the interpretation that uh, was placed on this verse in the lecture is different than what I had always thought. Uh, and again, uh, to my failing, uh, I always thought that the, the uh, words that couldn't be uttered were those of the person. Uh, and that the meaning of this verse was uh, when you get to the place that you run out of words and all you can do is groan, the Holy Spirit will intercede for you and tell God what you mean. But that's not the interpretation that you've got out of this. Well, I'm not sure that's totally off base in some ways. I mean, I look at it, this is the context in which I look at it. Um, it's a context, it was a context here. You have the groaning of the church uh, in the midst of the groaning world. Mm. Uh, that uh, is sustained and even inspired by the groaning of the Spirit. Mm. Um, so Paul clearly intends that these words really be seen, I think, in parallel. Uh, the Spirit, he says, helps our weakness. Or literally, the Spirit helps our... Or literally, literally the, the Spirit helps our weakness. So those who cannot... Uh, see that for which uh, 
they eagerly hope, hmm. need assistance to peer into the darkness ahead and see what God has in mind or what God will do. Hmm. So I, I, I see this, this tremendous, uh, tremendous situation that God put us in in saying, you're going to say, I think part of what you're saying is true. You're going to struggle with what, with what's going on. You're not going to have the words for it. But there, there will be someone to help you, not only with your words for you and for each other, but when you get to a place where you're stuck, he can speak to me because I know the human heart. He knows the human heart. And, he, and I know the human heart. And he can tell me what you really mean, what you really want. Yeah. But uh, in the lecture, you seem to indicate that it, the Holy Spirit was communicating by groaning, that it was the, the Holy Spirit. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, you said, the mind of the Spirit has no words to say for how terrible things are right now. Okay. So that there was a, mm -hmm. that, that the, mm -hmm. the spirit itself. Yes, I, I think the point Paul is making is that the spirit's own very self intercedes within the Christian mm. precisely at the point where he or she is faced with ruin and misery in the world, misery in the world, let's say, and finds that there are no words left to express in God's presence this sense of, of futility that I have. Mm -hmm. uh, or even this longing for redemption. What Paul is saying is that the spirit acting within the innermost uh, being of the Christian is doing the very interceding thing the Christian longs to do, even though the only evidence that we can produce that we want to do it is our inarticulate groaning. Mm -hmm. There aren't any words. And 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 the spirit also is is participating in and understanding the weight of the groaning. Yes. God's the, searching of hearts anticipates the final putting to right of all things. And so the spirit, he says, intercedes for God's people. And maybe he can take take those groanings and put them into words. Now this is this is totally beneath anything we're saying, mm. except I have a little uh, I have a dachshund who only speaks his his sister he is not really his sister but the female is with him yeah. uh, barks all the time. When I pet him, he just groans, just his little groans, and I interpret those groans. I will tell you, I interpret those. What he's really saying is <laughs> with his. Maybe it's that far apart that I think the groans sometimes that our, our misery are just not knowing what to, what's going to happen. You know, is this going to work out? Is this not? What's going to happen? This doubt that as inarticulate as it is, the mm -hmm. groaning sometimes all it is is just the, the pet me, love me. Yeah. Is that the spirit intercedes with the, the words of what the groaning means, what it's about, what the heart is saying. And, and, uh, if I understand correctly, and the Spirit understands that there is no answer. Yes. That there mm -hmm. is no, I, I, I mean, it, it's, we look for a mm -hmm. magic wand or a magic bullet or something to overcome it. And when it's not there, we get to the point where the only thing you can do is groan. The yes. only thing you can do, and and God shares our groan. And I think the groan is more appropriate than the people who will say, well, it'll all work out. Mm -hmm. Now, I've been more forgiving of that term. My mother used to say, it'll all work out. And then I realized what she means is, is correct. It will work out. Yeah. Now, she didn't say it's going to work out okay. She <laughs> said it's going to work out. Yeah. And I think often what people, people do mean when they say it'll work out is it'll be okay. Yeah. But it's not necessarily going to be okay. Yeah. People die. Yeah. People suffer. Yeah. There is great pain. There is groaning when people pain. If you take death easily, you don't understand death. Yeah, yeah. You know, so. And, and the, uh, there, there will be an answer. There will be a solution. Yes. But it may not be now. Yes, yes. Right. Uh, yes. The, uh, 
I think it's Hebrews that talks about we have not a high priest uh, who cannot be touched with the feelings of our own infirmities, but was in all points tested as we are. Mm -hmm. And that that is to say that he knows what the groanings are like. He knows the Gethsemanes of our lives. Mm -hmm. And he knows the the times when there is no answer but to face the inevitable. Yes. Uh, when you're in the garden and you say that you you wish you didn't have to do this, okay? Uh, and, but the only way is through Calvary. Uh, yes. And that God understands and participates in that longing. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. And and that's that's what at least that's the way I understand it. Yeah. Jimmy, got anything? Uh, the the passage about God knowing our heart, that He knows He knows the way that we feel. And I'm I'm like you that uh, I've I've always thought that that passage was that. We would be groaning, and the, yeah. the spirit would be like a translator. Yeah, yeah. But the translator would know what the groans put those groans into words. And and I, but it's 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 a lot more complicated. Um, it's a, it has a lot of depth. Yes, it has yes. more depth than I can get to. And, yes, it's just there. And I've I've heard it said that. Uh, uh, if we pray for what we shouldn't pray, that the Spirit will interpret for us. That He'll say, "God, He doesn't really mean that." Don't do that. <laughs> yes. uh, I hope that's true. Yeah, yeah. Well, but that's to kind of trivial, trivialize this passage, and yes. certainly yeah. is not contextually what it's getting at. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and of course, and you're going to this next. Your next question, I'm sure, is going to be Romans eight twenty eight. Yeah. Because it connects. Those we'll connect get there. Very much together. Yeah. 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 Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. So, but I think if you look at eight twenty eight, that it, that becomes more clear. If I can, if I can re yeah, relate to yeah. that, uh, and let's read eight twenty eight. That that'd be good. With me. Okay, uh, we are all aware that God works with those who love Him, those who have been called in accordance with His purpose, and turns everything to their good. Again, a, a little different uh, reading than we we're often uh, used to. Um, uh, the CEB, which is a more literal thing, quotes, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, uh, who are called according to his purpose. So there's several translations that one can look at. But the train of thought is this, is that God knows the mind of the Spirit. But we know that God works all things together for good to those who love him. Therefore, he works all things together uh, for those who love God, uh, everything that's good for us uh, and whom the Spirit is operating. Uh, all of, I mean, I'm always interested about the word all things. Mm. All, King James starts with all things work together. Yes. Well, we, we look at it and say, wait a minute, all things work together for this? But the, the subject of that sentence is misplaced. God is the subject of that sentence. Yeah. God works for all things to be part of it. So it's not just that all things work together for good, but but God uh, in in all things in all respects. Yes. Uh, God is doing this. So not just the groanings of uh, the previous verses, but the entire range of experiences uh, and events that we we face as God's people. Uh, are taken care of uh, by the Creator God, who who is planning is planning to renew the whole creation uh, and us along with it anyway. Yeah. So that's part of what He's doing. So this is a piece of that. Yeah, I heard somebody say. Uh, first of all, I like the translation that says God works all things for the good. Yes. Uh, yes. Which kind of goes along with what you said. Yes. Yes. Uh, I like that too. But I also heard someone else uh, say that you can't have 28 without having the verses that go before it. No. Uh, and that's kind of what you said yeah. in the lecture. Uh, and the lecture is not saying that everything will be a bed of roses. Yes. Uh, that the, um, and, the, and the verses before are saying that there will be times of trial and of tribulation, but regardless of the times of trial and tribulation, 
that God will still be yeah, in charge. Very good. I, I think the main problem in the letter up to now, up to until this, these, these verses, has been sin. Now attention is switched to the problem of suffering endured by believers. And so Paul is developing this thought uh, of contrast between the present suffering uh, and the future glory. Hmm. Uh, so he places this in the context of this perishable and fallen world that will be, be resolved in God's own good time. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and due time, his due time, I should say maybe God's due time. The renewal of the world then is an integral part of that hope you were talking about. It's a, the, the renewal of the world is a part of that hope uh, of, the, of the Christian, uh, Judeo-Christian tradition is that we have hope for this new creation. Uh, so believers suffer from decay and weakness of the bodily of their bodily lives. Uh, they experience uh, at the same time the reality of uh, salvation, as you were talking about. But they're, we're caught up in this tension of the now and the not yet. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in that salvation. Um, uh, is not yet fully realized. As you said, I, I realize I'm safe, but not it's not fully realized yeah, yeah. Uh, as, as yet. So we live by hope, which implies that things are not all they should be right now. Uh, and our weakness extends even to the inability to pray properly. But the Spirit is ready uh, to pray for us to God. Mm -hmm. and that, to me, pulls that context of hope in there. That's why I wanted yeah. to include 28 with that. And it is not to say that God will um, keep us from sickness no. or of decay or of death and that regardless of, what happy, uh, regardless of what happens to us, we should be smiling and skipping all the time. That yes. we should be that we should be singing. Yes. Uh, that it is the again the hope that we have is within the midst of the trials and and tribulations yes. that we will go through. Isn't it wonderful that the idea that Paul has this firm conviction that God has a plan for believers mm. that consists not only getting them through that but bringing them to share in the glory of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Here you go. Uh, duh. <laughs> Never quite grasp hold of these great thoughts he has. Yeah, and again, this get, gets back to our, our first discussion about the Passover. Yes. The Passover is not an isolated incident, nor is it an Old Testament incident alone, but that the entirety of God's plan from the creation of the world was the salvation of man. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and, in, and in that very Passover, which we experience now in, in doing the Lord's Supper, is not only is he saved to sin, but he's coming, coming again. Yeah. So we've got both of those pieces yeah. in that very, very thing. The resurrection. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that gives you an opportunity to put in your two cents. Well, I'm, I'm just going to repeat some of the things that uh, Bill just mentioned, but uh, in, in his talk uh, on, on this session, he, he said that uh, Christians are called to hard work, healing, teaching, feeding, comforting, caretaking, as you have done to the least of these, my brethren. Knowing that it is God who is at work through them, uh, to be sure at present we experience sufferings and groans, but we are sustained in the midst of them by that, what you said, the hope, the hope of glory, so far, it is only a hope because it is still future, unseen and unrealized, but grounded on the unwavering love of God. Mm -hmm. So there's that hope. There's that hope that is in the future, and that sustains us. That, that keeps us going. That, that gives us a motivation yeah. uh, to do these things. And I like that what you said, that God who is at work through us, God is working, working through us, doing these yes. things. Uh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful the way that God works these things out. Like you said, yes, yes. about the plan. 
that yes. God's plan for us. He has a plan for us. Yes. I, and I, and I, I think you glad you brought that up because in our, our next session, our final session, we'll look at even more specifically those things you're saying of how we can work and how we can respond in this mm -hmm. uh, time of the coronavirus. The uh, uh, application, so to speak. Yes, yes, yeah. yes exactly. Um, one of the interpretations that uh, I think you placed on Romans 8, 10, 28 was that God works with the Christian. Yes. Uh, does that mean that the Christian can thwart the will of God or in some way prevent God from getting done what he needs to get done? Jonah jo jo tried that, didn't he? <laughs> we, we have a good example about where Jonah tried to... to Thwart the, the plan of God. And by going in the opposite direction. Yes. That's yes. true. Well, so it's possible to, it's possible. to try to thwart. To try to thwart. And, and I do think sometimes that people, um, that the things we're wanting to happen are slowed down by people. Mm -hmm. I think they, they do, they create, they create more for us to stumble. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we forget that, that God is ever patient. He will, he will keep working toward what he's going. You're not going to stop his end, but you may well thwart the process, uh, as given what we live yeah. with it. Uh, well, and I like the uh, verse out of the only book. I think uh, I may be wrong, but I believe the one of the only book that doesn't actually use the name of God in it. The book Esther. of Esther. Yeah, that was just what I was thinking about because I thought. You know, God was going to use Esther yeah. to save the people. The nation, yeah. The nation. And if Esther had refused, to, I firmly believe that God would have chosen somebody else. Well, at least, and, and you're in good company because uh, Mordecai says that, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, he said, uh, yeah. you've been raised up for such a time as this, but if you choose not to do it, God will find somebody right. else. Right. And yeah. Interesting, people will say, well, Esther is the only book that God's name is not in, but God's all over the place. Yeah. yeah oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. yes God's fingerprints are there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but uh, the... So you're, you're not saying that because God works with the Christian that God somehow needs the Christian in order to get something done. No, and, and I would say a little more than that, picking up on what you said, Jim, is that this is not something we can say we get credit for. Mm. God's doing it, doing it through us. It yeah. doesn't mean that he, if we really want to be fully human, if we yeah. really want to be fully his children, that we will do what he wants us to do. Yeah. But at the end, we're not going to say, oh, boy, look what I did. We're yeah. going to say, no, gee, look like what God did with me. And we won't oh, say. Yeah, exactly. So and, and, and you, uh, actually, I think we'll say, uh, thank God he allowed me to be a part of, yes. of, of his army or his group yes. or his. We are an instrument. Yeah, yes. yeah. We are an instrument. Even though it's um, just very common in some ways, but I've been watching, of course, I'm a big March Madness fan, so. I was watching one of the one of the teams that is uh, happens to be a, uh, a quote Christian school, uh, and, and I use that in terms of not a school can be a Christian, but <laughs> yeah, the idea yeah, that, yeah. that that that's it's it's kind of like what it promulgates. But the players were saying after they had won, uh, and maybe they just say that as a term. But I thought it was very unique. They would say they were talking about how pr proud they were to be able to play and so on and so forth, and how. Thankful they were, and to God be the glory. Yes, and yes. I thought, yeah. how wonderful uh, yes. to hear on a very common stage someone at least recognizing God's presence and that they're saying, hey, with, without him, we're not able to do this stuff. And whatever whatever glory there is, it's really his. Yes. Well, yes. and um, the in the book of Revelation, that we have uh, crowns being given out to individuals but in the end, they take those crowns and throw them at the feet of Jesus. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, in fact, uh, that says to me, yes, you took part, but you're realizing that the real power is not in you, mm -hmm. uh, that it's really in God himself mm -hmm. that does it. Uh, another quote I have from the lecture says, we are called to be sign producers for God's kingdom. Uh, 
how can you be, okay, with the COVID virus, you don't really know what or why or how. Uh, God hasn't told me specifically what he's trying to accomplish here. How can, if I were to hold up a sign point, maybe it would be a question mark, okay? Mm. How can you be a sign producer if you don't know what's going on? Hmm. Well, I borrowed this, of course, from a, a new work that uh, uh, N.T. Wright has done with about signposts. But I like his answer to that. His answer is the signposts, if you go through the New Testament, and I, and I haven't read all of that, so I'm not sure his, his answer. But the answer I first got as I looked at it was that the signposts all the way through, no matter what other people are giving, the signpost is always Jesus. Mm. Yes. And I thought that when we were talking about uh, the idea of rule, and I thought of rule when I was thinking rule as a measure, is that we're that the Holy Spirit is always helping us measure our life by Jesus. Mm. And when we looked at the scriptures, the New Testament scriptures, the Gospels, whatever, uh, we're always looking at measuring ourselves by the word that is given to us of, of uh, history and of uh, the experience and the lives of these people who were followers of Jesus, who were disciples, and how to be a better disciple. Mm. Yeah. What do you say, Jeff? Well, uh, it talked about, you know, not knowing about what God is doing or where God is going. Uh, and in fact, uh, we don't have the knowledge of, of that. And we really don't, we don't need to know what God is doing or where he's going. Well, I sure would like to. <laughs> well, we, we'd like to, but like, like Bill said, Talking about signposts, you mentioned about the signpost being yes. Jesus. I was thinking about love, which is the same thing. Okay. I mean, Jesus taught love throughout his ministry, his actions. And and that that's what I like, that, that words may not mean, well, they probably don't mean as much as actions. Mm. So our signpost... I mean, talking about caring for those people that are sick. Yeah, we, keep, or, we talk about walking our talk. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. But, but caring for people that, that are sick or maybe caring for people that have lost a loved one. We just, we mentioned about that, yeah. about going to a funeral mm -hmm. and, and just basically listening to people. Uh, and uh, this thing about providing food. There is, there's so many people oh in this goodness. country that, that uh, are, are needing food. And just the very same, simple fact about providing food for people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's a signpost. The signpost. Yeah. The signpost. And Jesus uh, is here. Huh? Jesus is here. Yes. Yeah. 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 No. yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, some people have said uh, they've never seen Jesus in the flesh, but they've seen uh, Jesus in the flesh. Yes. Uh, <laughs> as he indwells in the hearts and lives of other people. Yeah, yeah. There, there, there was an elder at the, the, the church that I went to, and he went in to visit this lady that uh, had surgery. And as she was coming out of surgery, she saw this elderly man and later on, she, she shared with him. She said, when I saw you, she said, I thought you were an angel. Uh, and I mean, yeah. and this man, yeah. this man, he would be at the, at the hospital whenever somebody was sick. Mm. He would be there during the surgery. And, and like that time, he was in their room waiting for her to come out of the anesthesia, to wake up and everything. So, I mean, he was... I I knew him very well. He was an angel. Yeah. Uh, he he was a signpost. Yeah. He yeah. was that signpost. Uh, when I think of this question about the signpost and about what sign we might hold up, I think of the verse that says, "Be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you." Mm -hmm. uh, if I were challenged uh, to say. 
why is this going on? I would say, I don't know, but I know this. I know that God has been faithful, that God has been true, and that God has been my deliverer. Mm-hmm. And because of what I have experienced, I have hope that he will be there in the future as well. Mm-hmm. Amen. Okay. My last question. We started out off by saying, what does the rest of the New Testament, and in particular the rule of the Holy Spirit, have to teach us about our response to the pandemic? So I think it's, and we started this uh, video off by mentioning that, but I think it's appropriate for us to revisit that and to say, okay, so what does it teach us? What do you think? Well, what, some of those things we've talked about today, I, I think, but um, I think some of the things that I'm seeing as I move through through this is that when you move in through the New Testament, you begin to see when when people the changes that people are capable of making. But when I am truly converted toward God, mm. uh, when then I sense an equality that I did not experience before. Mm. One of the amazing things in the times of the New Testament was these people who all of a sudden gave up status and place and began to worship as one. Yeah. Uh, and that many times that evidently somebody had said, look how they love one another. Well, I hope they not only loved each other, I hope that love could permeate to, to the world some. Sure. But the point is, is that um, if we know who we are, then our lives have to be different than what they were and should be different than, quote, the world is, is a general kind of thing. So that should be kind of, I think, one of the things that we're learning all the time as we, as we move through uh, the New Testament uh, to, be truly, to be truly human mm. uh, is to be as Jesus made us to be. Mm. Uh, and then, uh, so you have all those things in the New Testament, but the work of the Holy Spirit as you've been mentioning this, is a, 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 almost another whole ball game. Yeah, yeah. And, and what um, uh, what he has to teach us, mm. Jim. Well, my question would be, when you talk about the rule of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's what, what it says. What, what what does that mean? The rule of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. That uh, that that may help me a little bit more about what knowing is, about is, the. What does rule mean to you? Rule is like a set of laws that we have to go by. That uh, and see, and, rule to me is a measure. Okay, like a ruler. Yes. Well, a ruler. And and to go a third route. Yes. Okay. Uh, I thought of our previous lecture about rain. Yes. Okay. Okay. The the rule, as in the reign of. Okay. Okay. And so it, it does have different different thoughts with it. Well, so the question is, teach us about our response to the pandemic. Um, and we've mentioned this before, that that uh, the pandemic is something that is such big news now that has affected so many people. But after that, virus is going to be hopefully contained yeah. with the vaccine, yeah. that there'll be something else. There'll be an earthquake, or a tornado, a death in the family, something like that. Yeah. So I see it as our response, we have an advocate. Yeah. We have a counsel, somebody that we can go to. Mm-hmm. That, that, and we've, we've been talking about this, about the grunge. Yes. So if, 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 if we don't have the answer, God has given us a Holy Spirit, His Holy Spirit that we can go to. And 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 it I think it's a comfort. It's a comfort that's when we don't know the answer, when we groan and don't know what to say. Yeah. The Holy Spirit is there to, to help us. To help us. And uh one of the things I used to tell people who would say, um, when you go to a funeral what do you say to the family? What can you say to the family? Mm-hmm. I used to say to them, don't say anything. Just cry with them. Okay? Cry and listen. Yeah, and cry groan and with listen. them. Okay? Yes. The Holy yes. Spirit, we have uh, a friend. Okay? We have someone 
who shares our grief. Um, and, we, and we talked about this thing about touching. Yeah. And you go into the funeral home and they're coming to you. Yeah. And mm-hmm. they, they want that touch. They want that hug. Yeah. You know, that is so important. That's, that's part of the healing process. Part of the healing process. That's part that's of the healing that's process. That's uh, and I think also uh, another answer to this particular question uh, is that while we have a hope in this life, our real hope is not fully fulfilled now. That was what you were yes. talking about mm-hmm. with the Romans 8 chapter. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, we have uh, a portion of the Holy Spirit and we have a promise of what's to come, but, but we live not for this life. Uh, we live for the life that is to come. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think that's another thing that we can, uh, that we can take from uh, as an answer to this particular question. Yes. yes. Uh, anything else anybody wants to say? Feels like a good place to close. Yes, I agree. <laughs> I agree. Okay, so we'll call it a wrap. Okay. Thank you.